So you woke up one day and you thought to yourself, I'm gonna run my own business because that's how I'm gonna make my own money that I'm happy with and work on the own projects that I wanna do and whenever I want to. Guess what? That's not how business work. So with that in mind, welcome to another episode of Hash to Find Train Podcast. I'm your host, Ronald Sosa. So what's the little intro just uh, I, I just giving you there uh, hints on? I want to talk to you about some of the heartaches and realistic side of things about running a business, some of the things people don't tend to think about. And I'm kind of hoping that by giving you some examples of the issues that I've had and the problems that I had to kind of deal with, that it might give you a better, uh, or it might give you a, a, a second chance to think about whether this is something you want to do. Now, immediately though, the problems I'm going to talk to you about are going to be one way or another uh, very contract um, bias. So, because that's what I do, I my company, I do contract work, I take on people's hardware, I design whatever I need to do, um, software, and you know, that's what I kind of deal with. But to be honest, some of the stuff, uh, if anything, this should hopefully hint the fact that whatever you take on, there is a risk and there's issues and you just need to kind of deal with it and face it head, head on if that is what you want to do. And now I'm not trying to put you off from running your own business, assuming you want to run your own business or you you were maybe thought about doing that. I'm not trying to put you off from that. I just want you to realize that um, it's not an easy thing. If you're thinking this is going to make you millions, then think again. Because actually this is one of the most annoying thing that I found when I started my business and that is everybody assumed that I was well off, that I was, I guess, what some of the people here in the UK might say, minted. Uh, In fact, that's what the the exact phrase that actually, I say it, annoyed me significantly, minted. Running a business doesn't necessarily mean that you're rich. In fact, it doesn't guarantee you to be well off. Uh, You could be a worse position than you were originally. But there are some pros of running a business that may actually, you might even consider just doing it that way just because of that. And one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was running and working on my own project. That was the driving factor for me to start my own business. And that was because I was constantly working on other people's project. And I was happy. I mean, to be honest, the company I left, the few companies that I left behind, I was quite happy working with the projects that I was working on them. It's electronics. You, you saw the positions that I was in uh, meant that I get to decide how the implementations are done and what they get to do. I don't necessarily get to decide the project that I'm working on. Uh, more importantly, which was the thing that frustrated me the most, th- people were setting deadlines that were unrealistic without actually taking into account the physical nature of the product. I.e., if you want to deliver something in three days' time and the product takes 10 days to calibrate, then you can't set the deadlines for three days, can't you? You need to wait for the product to be calibrated. This are, these were the issues that were driving me insane when I worked uh, for companies or when I was a, um, a, full, a full-time employee. But contract work has its issues as well. And the thing is, though, you're working for a client. The client has expectations, have needs, have requirements. They have their own deadline. And in all honesty, with regards to that deadlines, quite often when people come to me, it's because they're at the point of their, you know, they're tearing themselves apart because they can't quite deliver the product and they need extra help. That's quite often when somebody comes and gets my help because they're willing to pay the extra price to get somebody who knows what they're doing to get it done. And basically that is the problem right there. You're essentially, the reason why I started my business was to avoid people dictating deadlines that aren't realistic, but then I'm doing contract work, which is pretty much the definition of doing contract work. Somebody else is setting your deadlines, you have to deal with it. Now in the uh, rare occasion where I'm taking a project from the beginning, then that's a different problem altogether because no, that's a different problem altogether. But uh, the nicety is that I'm deciding that I'm taking on that project, which means I've uh, technically selected the project I wanted to work on and hopefully help with the setting the realistic deadlines. And those are great, but in all honesty, often when someone starts a new project, unless they don't have the infrastructure, it's rare they're going to go for a contract as it's here in the UK, or at least in the places that I've been dealing with anyway. They tend to have their own employees and, you know, and so on but but the point is though if that's why you think you're going to start a business and that is to um to set your own deadline to kind of work at your own pace that isn't necessarily the case you, it, there there's different industries out there but in the industry that i mean 
writing software, designing hardware, um, documentation, all that stuff, they all, clients tend to have their own deadlines and their own thing, and that is the issue there. But in all honesty, that's not really why I started this episode today. I wasn't really planning to tell you about deadlines and stuff, although that's, I'm sure you all know what deadlines are like and all that. Um, and to be honest, a lot of you probably realise that, yeah, if you're going to start contract work, that is basically an issue you're going to find. But to be honest, though, like originally when I started my business, I wanted to work on my own project. The intention was that I'd be developing my own products and then I'd be releasing those. And I'm pretty certain that, well, I can guarantee you that it's going to have the same issues as you working full time for another company where they've already created their own project your deadlines are going to be based on the people who are going to be buying your product or the people who are going to be using it. Your uh, time scales are going to be when you need to deliver a market, how much it needs to cost might restrict the what kind of project you can work on and how much you're willing to invest on. And so really all I was doing is trading one heartache to another. The difference is that I'm now able to work in my own office, in my own lab, uh, and essentially choose which contract to work on that day, assuming I've rearranged things in the correct and at the correct order and stuff like that. And so there is still some flexibility in there. And in fact, because I'm setting my own hours, I don't necessarily have to work uh, at the no, uh, at the normal time, so nine to five or whatever it is that some people might associate. Um, so there is some good stuff around in business. And in all honesty, I'm, I feel that that is outweighing the issues that might run a business, but I feel like I'm in a good position. This isn't necessarily the same situation somebody else is gonna have. Now, with regards to the heartaches of running your own business and, and kind of like what I've traded for a, 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 um, a consistent pay with the uh, with guarantee wage every every month, uh, which is the same thing as consistent, do apologize there. Um, yeah, I, I traded that for something that is not guaranteed and it's not consistent. And so let me just go ahead and start telling some of the heartaches you might find if you're running a contract. So the first thing is, uh, and it's, quite often the most complained about is invoices. So you may generate your invoice and you may have had an agreement with the company you're working on as to when they need to pay it. But until that money leaves their account and gets to yours, you haven't been paid. Until then, you have to chase it up. You have to be on the phone or on email and keep checking to see why people haven't paid you and that. And to be honest, that is the most annoying and quite frank the thing that takes up quite a lot of my time towards the end of the month because the the way I tend to set it up is that I will do work for that month and then on the last Friday of that month I will go and sit down and go through all the work that I've done, uh, print off timesheets, print off invoices, um, say print off like I'm actually physically printing off, generate timesheets, generate the, um, the invoices, email to people and for the occasional client call them up and tell them look I've sent you this because it's dependent on their uh, media. And I don't know if this is the same for anybody else, but when you take on so many different types of clients and they all have their own setup, that actually affects the way you invoice. And I, let me clarify by what I mean by that. Every client so far I've had has a different preferred form of communication. Now, you would think everybody uses emails and that's what they'll be using. Surprisingly, Everybody has emails, but every, everybody else has Slack, has Skype, has, well, I don't think Google Talk is still around, I think it's all integrated now anyway, but they all have like base camps and, um, and the, the one that GitHub released, I forget the name, I think it is GitHub, but there are so many different variations of, of, of communication and they all have their own system, not to mention one client that I have, have their own internal system, you have to physically log, log into their internet, their intranet I should say, uh, by VPN and then go through there and send everything through there. And it's just, it takes, it adds time, especially when you need to remember that that client might prefer in this format, this client might need another format. It's a pain and I'm sure there's loads of solutions out there to help you out with that. But when you're a single, you know, not single, one man band running a contract business and you're trying to keep your costs low, then basically means you're sacrificing one necessity with your time. So that's a heartache. Especially, I mean, not, I'm not even mentioning about the clients that haven't paid on time, but that's the pain. You have to sit down and deal with it. And some clients might have a requirement where you need to generate a timesheet as well as a receipt for any, uh, not receipt, a documentation explaining what you've achieved from those tasks. Uh, or another client which I have actually requires me to uh, 
uh, associate the uh, Git logs with their timesheets so their computer system can associate what's been paid. And, and that in itself is a pain because when, whenever that happens, you're assuming that their code is correct because pretty much every single time I send an invoice to that client, every single time I have to call them up and tell them, actually, you missed out this bit here and they have some sort of parsing error. And you would think that whoever created the software for them would have actually, uh, well, I don't know if they did it internally, I'd actually say. Oh, incidentally, I'm not worried about telling you too much, too many details about this client because they're no longer a, a client of mine anyway. Uh, yeah, but every single time you submit it, you have to give them a call and let them know and they say, yeah, this system saying that this doesn't match up. And you say, well, yeah, that's because the commit has, ends with three zeros and your software is expecting four digits. It's, uh, okay, fine. Anyway, it's, you know, that sort of heartache and you, you don't tend to think about that. And I guess what I'm trying to highlight here is the administration of your company, the paperwork of running business, uh, keeping it all sorted. And I'm not even mentioning, in all honesty, uh, to, I'm not going into too much details, actually creating your account work. And, you know, those, those, those paperwork you have to put fast through, uh, you have to kind of keep record of. But these are things that you don't tend to think twice about uh, when you want to start a business. You don't tend to think about the amount of time you have to spend on the phone calling a client to chase up a payment, the amount of time you have to spend talking to a client, a potential client to try and see if you can actually get contract work from them, or even worse, uh, the amount of time you have to spend chasing up current clients to see if they're actually going to submit the work they ask you to quote them a week before or however long. Those are the things that you don't tend to think about contract work and you tend to kind of find out as you're doing it. Now, I'm sure there's some course out there that you can take to tell you this sort of stuff. But if you're like me and you were in the position of just starting your business and just doing it and you're learning on the job, then these are things that are actually going to bite you in the end. Now, admittedly though, what tends to happen, and I don't know if it's the same with other, with other people running their own contract work, that when you finally realize or when that realization comes that you're actually assuming you're actually keeping record of your time, uh, realizing that actually you're spending this percentage in paperwork rather than working, and that means that's this ha how much money you're not gonna gain, um, then that's the point you realize, ah, that explains why now I'm doing extra time in the evenings to make up for those times, then there's the pain. There's, that's the thing that you sort of need to deal with, and you kind of have to adapt to kind of sort it out. Now, if you're in a good position where you've got some good set of clients constantly giving work consistently, you don't have to, you don't have to keep chasing them up, and you can leave them running, uh, free running, then, then you, that's good. That means that your overheads are reduced. But what do you do? I mean, you. I mean, uh, as far as far as I'm aware, that if you're trying to chase work, you're not getting paid for that work. You're actually spending. I guess you could say you're investing time and money to try and get what potentially will give you money. And these are things that you, you don't tend to get taught really. Uh, I'm, I'm not, well, to be honest, I say that I'm. Some, for some reason, I'm, I've got this feeling there'll be people out there who have done their research before studying contract work or uh, what I mean, like detail research, co talking to people or contractors and stuff. In my position, I didn't know anybody who was, who was doing contract work. Um, I basically spent a few years thinking that I needed to create a product to actually start a business. And then after that, I spent, um, I can't remember the exact, but the, all the research that I was doing were basically running the business. And it's, it's kind of annoying though, there's the, um, there was a book that I bought which I stupidly regret buying. Um, not to mention the, well, I regret buying, a, a, sorry, well, because the first couple of chapters that were in there uh, basically were specifically written to try and get you to buy the book. So they were basically explaining to you very quickly some of the key things that you're gonna face when running a business. But you, if, you, if you're kind of browsing a book or if you're using Amazon to see the first few chapters, then you might think, oh, if it's gone into this much detail on these two chapters, the other ones should be good. It turns out to be not the case. It turns out that the research, or the, all the research were done or all the, all the written work or the key material were done on the first two chapters and the rest were just to pad out the book and made it more expensive. What's the time? And it, what annoyed me though is that I bought that book uh, and then left it on to one side for a while. I think, and I'll read it when I get to the point where I'm about to actually start my business, and then I'll get on with that. 
and when I actually came to actually look for some information at that point the time the, the two weeks had gone by so I couldn't just submit it as a return and get my money back and then when I kept got, got the time to actually read it and then I realized actually this was a complete and utter crap not worth it should have just thrown it out it's not even good enough to actually burn uh, a, 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 if you have a fireplace because it's just got so much plastic on that already so anyway going off on a tangent there that was a complete waste but so yeah, when you come when you buy books like that, they don't. I mean, in all honesty, running a business it's like basically saying, right? I know what it is. I, here's a good explanation. For, this might be a good explanation for anybody who's a parent. If you ever buy a book uh, when you're gonna have your first child, so a, a book kind of tell you more about what to expect when you have a child and and what sort of things to look out for and stuff like that. If you ever buy a book like that, it's the same situation. You those books assume that your your child is gonna be an average child. But everybody knows, nobody's the same. Everything, everything's different. One child is not going to be the same as another. They might react, some stuff might react almost the same as other, other kids, but it isn't guaranteed. And the same thing goes with business. Every business is different. Every structure internally is different. Every person's state of mind when running a business is different. If one person leaves the company and another one takes over that role, the company instantly becomes different. It might be subtle, but it does. And that's the thing, a business is a living, not breathing thing, but a thing that changes and adapts based on that particular business needs. And so trying to buy a book to try and hint you how to run a business is like saying, here's a child, give it this um, apple a day and it'll be fine. It's like, yeah, that might work for the other one over there, but it doesn't necessarily mean your, your child's going to like apples. It's, it's, yeah, I can think you get what I mean by that. So yeah, I ended up learning on the on the job, and the whole invoicing thing, and the amount of time you spend trying to chase things up and paperwork, it yeah, it's up. It really does, and it will affect your bottom mar- your bottom margins. Now, if you were working a full time job, which I was doing uh, way back when, the yeah, the pay was consistent. If you if your if your employees were happy with your uh, with the amount of work you were doing, then you're still gonna get paid. As long as you they they're happy with what you're doing, you're going to get that money at the end of it. They, it. It doesn't matter whether they're they're making more money, if that company's making more money or not. You're expected to get that, that contracted uh, salary, and yeah, it's a complete difference. And it doesn't you don't have to worry about chasing up people to buy your company's product or that the company you work for's product. You don't have to go and deal with accounting work. You don't have to deal with phone calls, people calling and asking in, inquiries. All of this. You don't have to deal with, but you're running a business, and you, especially when you start out on your own, it's something you're gonna have to deal with. Now, another thing I wanted to mention, and that is whether whether you want to run your business for somebody else or not. And this is kind of like a, I kind of feel like this is something that is difficult to answer because, um, I mean, there's a point why I'm, I'm why I'm mentioning this, and that is that originally I was intending to start a business with a friend of mine. I. Uh, can't remember if I mentioned this in the first episode or not, um, but the idea behind the whole thing was for us to work together. And now thinking back, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I was afraid of me running the business on my own and facing problems on my own. I was worried that there would be a lot of stuff that I couldn't do and somebody else might be able to, and, it, and, I, was, and I figured that if I had two heads working on this, it would be better. And, you know, I was willing to accept that the money coming in may not necessarily survive, uh, uh, pay for two people, but it might be enough for us to get the ball rolling in that. And in all honesty, if that's the reason why you want to start a business with somebody else, then don't, right? If you can't do it on your own, if you're, if you, if it's something that can be done on your own, then you should do it on your own. There's, there's just no point of getting somebody else in. Now, this is different if the company running requires investment and you do need somebody else for that, then fine. But if you're gonna become a contractor, then why why add the overhead of having a second person in your business when you aren't really guaranteed to make enough to pay yourself? See, that's the sort of issues to kind of think about. And so thinking back when I was trying to get this other guy to, uh, well, when we were in the process of trying to start a business, I kind of regret it now because the thing is, I felt like I ended up wasting more time doing that and not realizing I could just go ahead and do it. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I feel like I'm going to keep saying this, the other thing I'm going to be mentioning, uh, it's actually, um, oh, lost my train of thought there. So I mentioned 
uh, stand up for somebody else, uh, overheads. That's the that's the one overheads. Now that's one that's the thing that I keep finding. Whenever you, if if you go online and you tend to look at small startups and they, I forget the exact percentage, but there's a figure going on online that X percentage of companies failed on their first year. But when you actually look at the detail, or when you look at some of these companies that are failing, you, you, you slowly start realizing why. Some of these companies think, oh, I'm going to start a business, and to run a business, I need this, I need that, I need to have this, I need to have that. If you take a step back a second, you are trying to start a business. What is the minimum amount of staff that you need, or what is the minimum amount of resources you require to run the business? Because that is going to be the failure. Now, I was lucky that my uh, my partner uh when i say partner i mean more in a relationship partner rather than a business partner uh that she mentioned that what she, i was lucky that she was strong-headed in in reminding me that that i don't need to have an office or i don't need to rent an office because one of the things that i was panicking about uh when starting a business is where am i going to have clients coming in and speaking to me where uh where am i going to have my meetings and to be honest, though, I can tell you now, forget that. If you're gonna run a business, don't bother, uh, don't bother spending money on actually trying to get an office. You don't need it. You just need a spare room somewhere. Or in my case, when I first started out, my basically hash defined headquarters was a corner in a living room, and I still got a picture. And I had like a a, a, a table that was barely a meter long, maybe a meter and maybe a meter and a quarter long barely enough space to have two motors uh, so two monitors uh, power supply scope and all the stuff that i need and everything else was underneath the table and all around me and it was like it's like if you're giving it enough time it's like if you would take a picture when i was working on it it seemed like the electronics were organically growing around me and they were about to swallow me up one of these days it's, it's like that's how cramped up it felt at the time and i made the most of it i i tend to work quite effectively with the, with the space that I have but like everybody else I eventually want more space to kind of do stuff um, but yeah if you can just get away find the find the corner you can work on make the most of it because that that could mean the difference between your business failing that year or failing in two years and I'm saying failing because it, it, it to be honest that was just a, a silly comment there but it can mean the difference between your business surviving or failing and yeah, when I started out, it was just a small little table. Uh, this is before I started working for Project Electronics. This is before uh, my second contract work. And it was a small space. But that saved me. I, I can't remember the exact figure, but that must have saved me at least five grand uh, a year on renting, because uh, renting places here in the UK or in, in Leeds, forget London, uh, is fairly cheap. I mean, to be honest, depending on the office space, if you were to go for a shared communion, a decent one is about 5,000. To be honest, for the sort of business work that I do, I, I would definitely need a place where you can lock it all up because the equipment I have are expensive. And if they get stolen, regardless whether the thief can actually uh, offload them or not, um, I mean, it'd be more like a waste of their time and a big resource hinderer for me. So it would need to be somewhere secure and somewhere where I can just close the door and ignore the people around. So it is going to be kind of like one of those shared offices kind of thing. But yeah, it was kind of small and about five thousand pounds. And to be honest, though, I, I I did do quite well. In fact, the first year I made just as much as I would have if I was doing salary. This is after taxes and profits and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I, it wasn't guaranteed. The thing is that you you just don't know. Your business might be just running marginally, or you might just be running at the break even point where you, you the amount of money you you're spending on running the business might be enough to just keep you fed and going. And that office space might be just enough to tip you over and get you to fail the company. And there are some places you actually do have to have somewhere to rent, in which case you need to really think about um, uh, actually getting uh, capital for that. And what I mean, like if you're going to start a business to run a coffee shop, then obviously you're going to need a space to sell coffee, whether that means you're getting a small little bike to drive around serving coffee, or whether that means just having a little stand somewhere that you can move around. The point is you need a place and all that. But for some businesses like this, you already have a house you're renting or you're buying. You might as well use it if you can. Now, uh, truthfully, I should point out, I don't know if it's the same thing in, say, in America and some of that, but in the UK, some houses you can't run a business and other ones you can. So that's something you really need to keep an eye out anyway. But 
if you can run it on the um, on the bare minimum don't bother wasting money on on an office don't bother buying a telephone line i mean i don't have a telephone line uh like a landline in my office in fact even if i do get bigger and have like an actual um have a full-fledged office with people in it i'm not gonna bother getting a telephone line it's it's just going to be you want to contact us because everything i do is all digital either contact me by my phone by my mobile phone or contact us by email if i have a client who wants to call talk to a particular a particular person in the office then you can very easily skype each other if you don't then that company is failing in the digital world and in all honesty like I can tell you, like all the businesses that I've worked, or the companies I've worked on, I very rarely ever have to call a landline, or very rarely I have to actually, I, I need a landline nearby. And to be honest, if you really need to, you can always pay for Skype services to do that, but yeah, it's not a problem now. But yeah, but just the overheads on that, that's, that's insane. Like 5,000 might not mean much for, for many people, but that is, that's that's a good chunk of money that after tax, I forget really the, the it really depends how much you earn that year, but that, potentially like four thousand can go straight to you as dividends and why why would you want to spend it on an office when you don't need it or or even better like i would rather spend that four thousand on some newer uh, office equipment like a, a, a nicer oscilloscope uh a, a better uh well, at least a uh, power supply that has more than 10 amps because um i've got some equipment here or some tools here that are not tools uh, some boards that I'm developing that need a bit more oomph than that. So I'm currently using a computer power supply just to get by. But it'd be nice to actually have a proper power supply where I can actually do a proper, uh, I keep using the proper, but actually graph out the um, uh, the power that's going into that. Uh, yeah, I might explain that in a future episode or not, unless he burns down the house, because, yeah, it's all the rampage. Anyway, off the top of that. So, yeah, that's a not, that's a, that's an issue. So I guess the next thing I need to mention uh, is contract work and the dangers behind it. You may not actually get paid at all. And I've had that, uh, I've had that situation a few times. And the first one was the scariest one because that was my first ever contract, the reason why my business actually got started. And it was the company I was working with. I won't bother mentioning names and stuff like that. I don't, they can listen to this if they want to. They should be ashamed for doing this, in fact. Um, the contract work that I was doing with them, they actually ended up not following the rules of the contract. I made, I made the effort of writing up a agreement between us, a, a, like a, a work of contract. And in that contract, I stated that uh, the minimum amount of work you're going to give me is four months. And then after that, it's going to be a month following contract. And you need to give me explicit, um, you need to have written form when you want to end the contract. And everybody was happy with it, you know. I originally sent the contract to them to, to have a look at it and they had their, uh, the person that owned the company originally went through, made some amendments, sent it back. And, uh, you know, there was a few things that I had to sacrifice. For example, um, who owns the IP and stuff of whatever product that I'm designing. And there was stuff that you kind of have to kind of give away. But the bit that actually stayed in there were that when the, you know, to cancel the contract, it's kind of pretty much like, it was pretty much like me being on salary. You want to you wanna end my contract, you have to give me a month's notice. Uh, or unless I agree to end it or something along those lines. And yeah, like uh, I had my four months and we were already on the rolling po- portion and I came back. Um, I was doing work for them on their one of the new projects that they wanted to do. And I was doing some optimizing code and things got quiet towards the end of it. Like it's like it's, it's, It was like a really bad relationship. It was about to, like if you've ever been in a relationship with another person and... And, and it's not working out towards the end, one other person is going to become uh, quieter or one other person is going to be different. It's going to, it's just not going to be what you actually enter the relationship with. And towards the end on this contract work or this client, it got to a point where uh, I was doing work and they've already given me a lot of work to do. And basically I was just keeping, I was just keep going with it. And I just found that for one week, they didn't, we didn't have a meeting in the week after that they have another meeting and then suddenly um, we had another meeting and we went in there and they want to, to talk about this new project they want to work on. Uh, they want to scrap the old project or they want to stop that project and just call it quits and just focus all their time and effort onto this new project. And now I should have been, I, sh- I should have seen the, the telltale sign that something wasn't right because 
the reason why I was brought in was to work on the previous project because there are guys there. Uh, well, I, well I, I'll be upfront with it. They they already had a lot of projects uh, they were working on, and they were underpowered. Under, uh, they were low on. on um, no, that's not the right term to use, is it? No. They were low on resources, so there are guys who were really busy doing work, and they they were having issues with that project that I knew quite well of, so they actually asked me to come in and work on that. And so it got to a point where they actually got me to stop working on that, and they guys took over. And I just said, fine, I, I have no issues to worry about because my contract's got me uh, covered. I just need to make sure that uh, they give me a notice before ending it, and we should be good to go. And so I didn't bother worrying, I just, I just assumed... Fine, I'll just work on whatever else they put me on, and they did. They moved me on to an older, older project, and I was doing code fixes and stuff like that, and optimization. And then they brought me in for a meeting. We talked about this brand new project they wanted to work on, and they asked me to quote them, and I did. I spent a week, yeah, I think it was a week. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. I, I spent a week writing up a specification for that project, and this being the first full project that I was going to start out on my business, I figured. I'm not gonna make sure I do everything right, and I went to full detail with it, explained all the pros and cons, the standards we're gonna follow, the, you know, everything down to the smallest detail. And there was a back and forth between uh, how much it's gonna cost, and they kept changing specs, and the price kept going up and down, up and down. And eventually got to the final meeting on that project, and the guy I was, yeah, like the representative that I was dealing with, uh, I said, okay, so, I guess when you start working on this project, we'll call the other one. We'll call the other one as end. We'll uh, end your current contract for that one. We'll start a new one for this project because the idea would be that I was no longer going to be in contract, and they're just going to basically sign an agreement for me to work on that project, and that's what I was going to deliver a finished product. And so it was going to become more like I'm going to develop product, and they have it rather than me doing bits and bobs of them around the office for them. So yeah, I said okay, fine. So when we start this project, uh, we'll call the other one quits. There's no point in me. And that contract because they're not, it's no longer affecting for this, and this, they, they wanted to, to have it out because they were, uh, they were, uh, they were wanting a fixed cost for this project because they were already they already had plenty of issues with their with their employees, uh, with costs overrunning projects overrunning, um, where they they you know the quota for something and they ended up taking so long and things just costs get mounted up and they wanted something that was done right, and they essentially they wanted to put their responsibility on my side. To make sure the product is delivered so if there's any issues regardless of what's going to happen i can't charge it anymore and i have to fix it so and i was I, to be quite honest even till today i'm quite confident when i enter those sort of contracts that i'm happy to go ahead and do it and when you think about it those type of contracts it's all about risks you're essentially saying you, someone has to make money and i'm only going to enter that contract if that's going to go in my in my favor and if the client is willing to pay for that and then that's the thing okay if there's an issue then yeah, I should be fixing it because I said to them that I was going to deliver them. Anyway, so that's fine. And I sent off the agreement uh, and the specification. They just needed to sign it at the bottom and say, yeah, okay, we're happy with um, with this. You can start it and I can get on with it. And so at the end of that meeting, the guy, like as I mentioned, was saying, um, you, could you, um, okay, when we start this new project, then your contract is no longer valid. Is that fine? I said, fine, I'm happy with that. There was no written um, notification of that. I just said I was going to say, right, fine, contract doesn't work. And the way I, f I figured is when they sign the new the new project, I'll go ahead and send an email saying the old one is no longer valid and we're good to go. I don't have to worry about it. But they took a while for them to carry on processing the new project. Or they took a while and, I, and I'm pretty certain it got to a point internally they decided actually it's going to cost too much money to do that. I wouldn't going to bother. But at this point, they hadn't cancelled my old contract. There was not getting any written notification. And I was still working on one of the old projects for them. I was still doing some code optimization, improving this stuff, and giving them some submission. Because that was the agreement. That was what I was going to end up doing. Um, then I sent my invoice uh, for that month. And then I got a call back from the guy. I said, so I didn't approve this invoice. And I said, what do you mean? Or, we, we haven't actually asked you to do any work for this, for this month. And you just charged up for a, for a month's work and said, yeah, you have. But my old contract's still going. I'm still working on a project we agreed. Now, at this point, I should have I should have realized that um, after that meeting, uh, after that meeting, I was still doing work for them on the under the old contract. And we hadn't had any meetings to kind of update on what I've been doing on that. 
and I should have figured at that point that there was something fishy about that. But we just finished an old con and a meeting for the for the new project, and in all honesty, I felt kind of awful the fact that he pointed it out, and I realized ah, that's true. I, I haven't been giving any, we haven't been updating on the work I've been doing. But I pointed out to the person, we have a contract, and that contract requires me to carry on working on stuff, and this is the project I was working on before you asked me to do the agreement on that, and also. And this is the thing I did. The work that I spent writing the specification for the new project was actually covered under the old one because that was an agreement that we had uh, when I started doing that, that whatever work I do towards it, it's going to be charged for that. So if they want to do a specification, it's going to be part of it. And they understand. I mean, when I spoke to the guy and I was dealing with it, he understand why I was doing that because this is my first contract and the reason why I started this was because of them. And so for me not to get paid for a week's worth of work of writing this, it's just not feasible for me. So yeah, that my invoice covered all of that, a month's worth of work, and it was a good hefty pay as well though. And said, oh, we can't pay for that, we didn't agree with that. I said, well, we still got a contract, and you have to, you haven't given me a notice. And he goes, well, actually, the um, I think I probably should point out, at this point, we decided to have a meeting, and it was just me and him, and I went into the office. And at this point, we are just face-to-face -face having a chat, and he said, well, I thought we agreed on the last meeting that the other contract's no longer valid. I said, no. We agreed that it's not going to be valid, so it's going to be over, terminated when the new con or the new project has been signed. If you don't sign that, then I have no need to cancel the old one, and even then, it needs to be done through inform. And at that point, the guy, the guy goes, "Oh right, yeah, but anyway." The point is, at that point, I was a bit weak, and more importantly, worried. I'm a, over my, I am a one-man band. I have no. I had no backups behind me for anything. This is the first project. And um, in my point of view was, is how much of the money can I keep? And it became more of a haggling uh, meeting rather than a um, uh, who's right and who's wrong. And I was trying to avoid burning any bridges, but in all honesty though, uh, I was pretty happy to burn that bridge because it, I didn't really want to work with them in the first place and all that, and anyway. So the, the argument just went on and on and on, and it, an argument, the, the conversation went on and on. And eventually I just said, look, this work here, your guys sent me the specification and asked me to work on that. Your guys did that, have written emails proving that. So therefore, you, this proof to me proves that you were still under contract. And the guy goes, oh yeah, but I thought we, no, this proved to me we're still under contract, right? Even if there was not been any termination emails being sent through or anything written, your guys still sent me work and I did it. This extra work here, which is for the specification, you asked me to do that, and you got me to do that. And so basically, you got to a point where they only ended up paying for half of the invoice. And the bit basically that I was able to prove that there were bad people sent over the other bit, it was more like, well, you didn't have an agreement for that. And I went, okay, fine. My, my contract did say that every work that I do will be under agreement, and we missed our last email, our last meeting, so I guess this doesn't count. And I said to him, like, fine, okay, at least pay for that half. And they did. Then they brought me in. Yeah, that's it. So then they brought me in for another meeting. And I think this, this was to basically uh, talk about the new project. So I went in and the guy was saying, OK, so is there anything else you can do uh, to optimize this or change that? I said, look, I, I really can't do any more work on this. Um, obviously, you've only paid for half my invoice and I don't really feel like I spend any more time on something that may not necessarily give me anything to. And to be honest, knowing your history, this sort of project and the cost, Chances are you're probably not going to actually do any more work on it. And then he goes, okay, um, fine, but we can't pay you for the other half of the invoice, but if you do actually end up working on this project, I said to him, look, if you want this software, uh, let me take a step back. The reason why I went in for the second time, for the final time, was to show the work that I was trying to get them to pay that they got me to do. I mean, they're, that didn't, in their eyes, didn't get the approval, but under the contract, I should have been able to do it. Uh, I was demoing this work and said, oh, that's really good. And they were quite happy with how I managed to essentially remove one of the biggest issues that their system was having, and that is to do with a very slow user interface by doing a lot of good code optimization. And they were happy with that. And he goes, oh, um, so did we pay for that? I said, no, didn't. Oh, but you did it under our system. So, so it doesn't matter. We're no longer in a contract and you've already paid for half of the work. You didn't pay for this bit. Okay. And then the guy goes, all right, but if you're going to be working on this new project, which is what they wanted me to work on, 
would you be able to incorporate that in there? So to be honest, if I start working on this project with you, I will be charging you for the other half of the invoice anyway, because that's going to be part of it. So regardless, this is how it's going to work. And that essentially was kind of me burning the bridge uh, with them at that point. But to be honest, I don't regret it because uh, I have to, had the occasional calls from them with regards to stuff, but I've just been turning them down. There's no point of working with a company who aren't really going to keep up with an actual contract work. And in, in all honesty, I don't have the time or the resources to be chasing stuff like that. So, so I left as it is. But in all honesty, though, I I kind of feel like I, I, that that was a good, um, scary, but a very good way for me to learn that running the business isn't easy and you have to be prepared for failures like that or issues like that. So if you're going to run your own business, do bear in mind that you're going to have stuff like that. I mean, to be honest, I've, I've had issues with that, uh, not similar problem as that one, but I've had a few other different problems where they're trying to chase invoices, trying to prove the work I've done, that sort of stuff. But all mostly because some somebody who doesn't want to pay another person feels like they ought to be paid. And in that case, I wanted to be paid and they didn't want to. Although I suspect that they have realized, um, I, I do suspect that the person I was working on in that company or working with in that company they got put under a lot of pressure to terminate my contract because they were realizing they were paying me extra even though they got two other guys who weren't up to par with the work I was doing. So I guess they just, I mean, this is probably me just selfishly thinking it that way, not selfishly, but kind of big headedly thinking it that way. But I, sus I suspect they got put under pressure to end my contract and force their two other guys to actually do the work. So whatever happened though, um, they got what they wanted. They, they got their guys to get up to speed with the work, which I, which is the reason why I went in there in the first place and I got the initial money boost that I needed to keep my company running. Although that said, and this is probably the final section I'm going to talk about, uh, the possible heartaches you can have for running a business, and that is what happened after that. It took nearly two and a half months before I managed to land my second contract. Uh, that's two and a half months where I was speaking to agencies, chasing up contract work, calling people up, offering my services, and just trying anything that I can to try and get different type of contract work. It took two and a half months. And then after all that, it was a tweet that a colleague sent out, or a, fr a, a long time friend sent out that kickstarted that, um, that actually brought me back into having contract work and that. And it, after that tweet, I think it took nearly a month and a half before I actually got paid from that contract work I was gonna do. But the point is though, that was two and a half months uh, was it two and a half months? No, hang on, I'm lying. It was three months. Yeah, it was three months because after that tweet, it took it took time for it to be to kind of to be put through and and for me to actually show up and kind of see what we need to do, kind of thing. But that's three months without uh, me actually having any work. Four, if you count the time it takes for me to actually get paid from that new contract. So that's four months without pay. That's four months uh, where my business had to survive on the savings that I, I got from my first ever contract, that four months, four and a half months worth of pay of keeping the company running. And that's not that's not counting the money that I had to use to invest to start the company, um, initial, uh, not initialize, uh, any investment I needed for tools and stuff at the time, but that's four months. Think about that. That is four months that I didn't have any pay. That's four months that I had to kind of think about what I need to do. That may or may not be a killer for companies that if you're starting a business that might be more sensitive to you. You know, that's the sort of stuff you really need to be thinking about when you're starting a business. And in all honesty, that was the last and only time I've, that I've had that um, that uh, dry period. And ever since that happened, I always assumed there will be three or four months that I may not get paid. So whenever I'm doing contract work, I work them to make sure there's plenty of pay for at least six months. Now, I say six months because you always have to have a backup plan to exit or an exit plan. Now, I think this is a thing that I feel that not many people tend to think about when to quit. You really need to think about this. You need to, you need to have a plan as to when you want to quit. Because the thing is though, you can't not get paid for, for too long. You, you can only last for so long before the business is no longer feasible. Now, for some people that uh, quitting point, it might be a lot earlier than what it took me. In fact, uh, I made myself a rule of quitting, you know, to just stop doing contract work after two months and just trying to start searching for full-time work after the second month. Uh, in all honesty, I didn't do that. I broke my rule and I waited for the third month. In fact, uh, after that tweet, after I received that tweet, I probably was gonna 
I would say within that week, I was going to end the whole thing and just get on with looking for a full-time job because I had enough savings, personal savings, I would say, um, before I start, started doing contract work to survive six months without work. And I, I, I kind of felt like four months would be the worst, uh, the utmost desperate point where I was willing to quit. But now, ideally, you want the savings that you've made to be company saving rather than the rather than a um, I say that actually no you know what I, th- I think this would be a good question to ask an accountant if I if I want to quit where should the saving be for to keep me alive long enough with a uh, lo- long enough for me to decide when to quit uh, so let me explain what I mean by that anyway by uh, quitting so if if the, after the three or four months went by and I hadn't got contract work, then at that point I would give up on the contract work and just focus purely on looking for full-time jobs, stuff that will be feasible, stuff that I know I can apply and get, because there's plenty of full-time work anywhere in the UK you can go to, even if I have to sweep floors. I'm not, you know, I, I have no issues with whatever the work I get. I mean, I've, I mentioned this to plenty of people before. One of the happiest jobs that I had when I, well, you know, when I was younger, I was working at Sainsbury's, which is a supermarket here in the UK, uh, in the bakery. I was the baker. I was. Uh, I did things like. Um, I, I don't mind admitting this because I. It was one of my fondest, uh, fondest jobs. Is I put out bread, I sliced bread. I gave out the pastries within the counter. I made the pastries in the back. Occasionally, help out with baking the bread themselves. So it was a brilliant job, and what made the job better for me. And I guess it's all down to, I guess you, this is dependent on, the, on who you are kind of thing. But what made the job nicer for me was that with some of those jobs that I was doing with them, I was able to come in really early, like earlier than the, cus- the customers come in. So I didn't actually, there'd be like weeks where I didn't have to actually deal with everyday clients. I just had to deal with uh, c- client customers. I could just focus in the back room, make the pastries, make the donuts, uh, bake the cookies or the bread or whatever and just put them out. And I was good to do that, and, and I was doing that, like, m- most Sundays, I was happy to do that as well in there, and it was great. I don't mind going back to stuff like that. There's always something you can do, and as long as you're willing to put your um, honor, that's not the right word to use here, as long as you're willing to put, I guess if, if you're willing to put yourself to one side and think, actually, this is just a job, then anything will do the job, anything will get your money, and that's the point of having a backup plan and running a business. You need to be willing to do something else. You need to be willing to not be working in electronics if you don't have to, which is in fact is how I now am constantly getting contract work uh, all the time because I no longer limited myself to just working in electronics and developing software for the embedded hardware or just developing ATX hardware. I'm now doing web development. I'm now doing firmware for the occasional project here. I'm doing occasional hardware over there. Uh, I'm doing occasional documentation here. Basically, I'm applying all the skills that I have to run my business. And that keeps the money going and it pays really well. So that's the thing I would say, if you're gonna take anything from this, just make sure you're taking that there's risks that you have to take into account or risks that you may not even see it until you start doing it. You need to have some sort of um, money buffer there in case you have to actually quit your project or quit your contract work or quit your business, I mean. Because to be honest though, not every business succeeds and even if you do try and follow some of the advices here, it doesn't guarantee that what I'm saying is gonna work for you. But just make sure you have some sort of buffer there and try and keep your business uh, res- um, your business um, overheads low. Do you really need that office? Do you need that brand new chair? Could you not just use the kitchen chair or could you not use the stool for a week or two if need be? Or could you not just go out to the um, to the dumpster sites or the or somewhere where they just throw away used to electronics and the phone, just savage office equipment from there. Could you not just do that? Like, yes, it's nice to have a brand new a table and it's nice to have a brand new keyboard and mouse, but do you need to actually be paying for that straight away when your business is just starting out? Or better yet, do you really need to have that um, 3D space mouse uh, to use on Altium or SolidWorks or any other kind of software? Do you really need that? I, I don't think you do, do you? I, I'd rather just pocket the money, keep it to one side, build out that buffer, and then once you've got that buffer and you're happy to just quit when things don't work out, then just go ahead and start spending the money so that might make your business easier and better. Although I should point out that, although I'm saying to people that do you really need to go and spend money on an office, 
I would love to have an office. Don't get me don't get me wrong. I'm not against having an, an idea. I'm not against the idea of actually having my own. I know I say office, my own lab, but I mean, I, I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to have a dedicated place where people can come and see you? But when I'm working on contract work, I'm either gonna go and see the clients on their office, or more often than not, they're they're happy for me to meet them at a coffee shop, and I just tell them upfront. I don't lie to them. I don't tell them I'm a big business person uh, and I have a headquarters in the middle of London. I, I don't. They know. They know I'm working from home because that's how they're gonna get cheap labor from you. If you have an office, then that's that's gonna add to your contract rate. The fact that you're able to offer a good rate that you're happy with to make the money that you want to make, and they're happy to pay for that, then that means they're gonna understand that there's a reason why. Now, admittedly though, um, rates are something I probably have to have a chat about with you guys at some point in the future because that's another area of where you're gonna have issues. And that is, what is the correct rate for you to be using? Um, I was quite lucky because, again, my partner that I'm with, she was, she's a lot wiser than, to be honest, even better. Uh, I am very uh, blessed to have her because she, there was just stuff that I never, th- there's just stuff that she just mentions and you just go, oh, yeah, that's right. Why well, didn't I think of that? Things like working out your rates, like, in my mind the way I did is I had a spreadsheet and I wrote down all the ingoings and all the outgoings and all the stuff that I want to invest on and all the stuff that I need but then there were little things that like that you don't tend to think about and as I mentioned earlier the amount of time you're going to spend uh, actually doing paperwork to try and get contract work that counts as a uh, that counts as a, as, as a waste of, as a used up resource rather than you actually working on a contract and actually doing work you're actually having to spend to try and get more contract you need to put that down on that now, immediately though, originally when I did my original rates, they it took it, they, it was very relaxed on the figures in the sense that I said, oh, I'm gonna spend uh, five days a month doing account work and paperwork, and then I spend ten days a month. No, it's ten days too much. Another two days doing um, chasing contract work in there, and then I'm gonna give myself twenty three days sick sick pay in case you know in case I do get ill. And then I give myself a further 20 days or whatever it is on holidays. And I can tell you now that all of that was just the right amount for me to get a, a decent rate for the decent wage that I wanted to get and the decent money to come into the business. But I can tell you now that I, I'm the kind of person who very rarely gets ill. So even though I put 23 days on a sick pay, I made it, I, 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 you know, it was just there just in case, but in reality, I've never once used it. But the funny thing is, the amount of time I spent on trying to find clients and trying to do contract work, actually ended up, ended up being a lot longer than the two days that I quoted for, which essentially ended up taking it out from the sick pay days that I'm allocating myself to, to be ill. So the fact that I overestimated it in different areas, but still added towards the rate in the correct positive direction, uh, it just went to show you that I completely underestimated the amount of time I was going to spend on searching for contract and actually calling people about the actual contract and working on that moment in time, because not every job that you do will actually allow you, will will, let, will actually is right for you to be charging them for calling them if you're just telling them oh I've pushed this or you're chasing up some information they may need. Sometimes you can charge, sometimes you can't, and the point is that that will eat up that could potentially eat up the amount of time you've allocated for yourself per month of non-payable hours. Um, so just, yeah, bear that in mind. And, you know, it's you know it's a life learning lesson, really. So things just happen and you're going to have to kind of deal with it as you go. Right, so before I go, I want to talk to about, actually, I was going to talk about my robot, but I feel like it's already 50-odd minutes now and I'm not sure if it's worth going to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll leave it for the next episode. Um, I'll kind of add it towards the end. Uh, I kind of feel like it was kind of nice to tell you more about things to watch out when you're kind of starting a business and things people don't tend to realize when you're actually running a business. And to be honest, there's loads of other issues that I've had and I'm sure I'll kind of cover them up. If you have any questions, uh, you can find me on the website. I do have a comment section, you can leave it there. Uh, I am planning to put together a forum dedicated for the projects and stuff and I might just put a podcast section in there for in case anybody who do want to subscribe and actually go ahead and leave comments or questions, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, the one thing I was going to point out is I, I have a YouTube channel for this podcast. Um, I 
think I mentioned it on the previous video that I was going to do it. I, I have gone ahead and done it. So you can listen to this on YouTube if you want to do it that way. Um, to be honest, it's just a static picture with me talking. So it's not really much to see there. Uh, the difference is, I guess, you get adverts because that's kind of how the YouTube channel has been set up. But other than that, though, it's more just because there's another section to be for you kind of get, kind of download and see. Uh, but if you're like me, you're probably going to just be using your phone and getting podcasts through to that anyway. So it's not a big deal. Uh, that said, uh, let's just end this up with a with a good moment. So, if you're feeling sociable, you can find me on Twitter. My username is Optical Worm, and I also have a, a Twitter account for the company. So that that is hash define left. Um, if you're interested on my YouTube videos, uh, go ahead and go, uh, I mean, they, all, they will all be linked up. You can find me on YouTube. Um, I am planning to start releasing more videos on the project, unless they already are. I forget if, if I've done that now since I uploaded this. Eh, future self, make sure you do that. Okay, got it. Um, and that's it. So, yeah, see you later. Bye.